Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 339. That's tres, tres nuevo for my Espanol speakers out there. Como estas? Bien. Amazing. Cool. Nos vemos. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Amazing. Great. If it's your first time watching this show and you're watching it via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below. If you're listening to this thing via your headphones, via some sort of audio listening device that you put inside your earlobe or on the outside, such as I have with my headphones, make sure you smash that, you know, subscribe button, wherever it may be on, on the screen, share it with your friends, leave me a five star review, whatever good thing you can do to help a brother out, do it. All right. Because it's lockdown season right now and we're all suffering out here suffering all right we're all suffering we're all in pain we're all hurt um, we haven't seen our families our friends um, our finances are dwindling and as you can tell by my hair you know our sanity is slowly but surely slipping away from our fingertips like sand slipping through your fingers it's a tough time right now to be alive but we try and we try and persevere in it we try and persevere that's what we can do we're just hoping that suddenly it's going to get better that's what I f that's what it kind of feels like when you go online it feels like everybody is sort of like collectively holding their breath in the hopes that suddenly things get okay right in the, like within the next couple of weeks like everyone's everyone's sort of living in the two week increments right like, okay two weeks two weeks that's because to get the that's usually the spikes and usually the numbers get updated and all that sort of nonsense so we're all kind of on this kind of two week kind of merry-go-round but i don't know man i think we have to slowly but surely just accept the situation that we're in and just say hey summer's over your year's done start mentally preparing for next year that's what i would say in my opinion, because I think it's finished, isn't it? it's over. What else do we have to look forward to? Economies that, that, you know, we've seen now the stock market is effectively fake, right? How the stock market is still sustaining and maintaining itself when no one's working. Like the, let's, let's, let's say no one. Let's say the majority of the workforce, the ones that are like, you know, let's say between, yeah, entry level to mid level. Yeah, people are like, you know, most of the people are not working or the entry, especially the service industry jobs, they completely can put. And how's the stock market still surviving? It doesn't make any sense. So that's why we know the stock market's fake. Yet we're all we're all meant to kind of like, you know, pretend like it's all rosy, everything's fine. It's not, mate. It really mm. isn't fine. You know it. You you know it deep down. You can feel it in your bones. You're like, hold on. If I'm not working and my friend isn't, and the guy across the street got his hours cut, and my supermarket across the way has only got five employees when it's a massive supermarket, this doesn't make any sense, right? You know your head something's wrong, but your government keeps telling you it's okay. Use your common sense, stay alert, British manners, all this sort of nonsense. It's like, God damn it, man. And I mentioned it previously on here already, but it just makes you wonder, isn't it? Like, like um, it doesn't. It, it's so it's so revealing to see just how inept, how um, unable. Like, yeah, inept is probably the best word to to describe them, right? Politicians are in, in moments of crisis, right? Because I'd, I'd imagine this will be the time when you actually earn your money. You actually cement your legacy. You go down in the history books and like, oh, he or she, you know, put this in place and this how allowed this amount of people to escape being fired. This amount, this allowed a certain amount of people to keep their restaurants, to keep their bars. Like this is where your, your legacy is really cemented. Your family name really kind of goes up on the man stool, right? Or kind of goes up on the flagpole. This is where it really happens. But instead... Politicians have been found wanting, in it? Everywhere. And it's not even like an American thing. It's not just a Trump thing. Everywhere. Every country you look at that isn't New Zealand, Vietnam, or a few others, everyone's government's just been, like, floundering, in it? And, it's looked at, and, it, and, it's, and, and it seems like... Maybe it's the same you see in football, right? When a team is going... When a team is going, like... When a team is on a downward spiral, like an Aston Villa or a Norwich, there's no, like... There's no... On most occasions, they don't suddenly... They don't suddenly change their fortunes or change the course of their trajectory. If it's going downhill, sorry about that. It just goes downhill. There's nothing you can do to sort of like turn it around. It's, it's they're in, it's, they're in effectively they're in free fall, and you see the government in the same sort of position, right? They sort of got it wrong with COVID. You get yeah, everyone kind of got it wrong. They didn't really treat it as serious. Well, the places that where the numbers are you know exponentially high, you can you know you're, it's fair to say to come to the conclusion that they didn't necessarily take the necessary precautions early on, right? They didn't lock down quick enough. They didn't implement, you know, processes. They didn't implement processes. They didn't uh, and consult all the health professionals or medical professionals. They didn't, you know, they didn't kind of, uh, they didn't sort of like uh, push this kind of radical honesty to their populace. They just sort of like kind of went with it, right? Just let's just see how it goes. Let's just see how it goes. And they've essentially all messed up. 
but they can't they can't seem to turn it around they can't seem to like change course okay i'd be like cool let's go back to the drawing board and let's try and figure out how we can best manage it how we are now they just seem to just like let it go like okay cool it's done we fucked it up what can we do just let it go it sort of reminds me of like those videos i used to like watching on reddit of girls falling over <laughs> right i remember mentioning it once at a party and people were looking at me like this guy's a psych sociopath it's like no it's just funny to watch because as a boy growing up or as a kid growing up where you play contact sports right or you mess around with your brothers or with you know in general you just always play fighting to impress girls whatever you're doing right i'm used to just like i'm used to somebody uh i'm used to a bit of rough and tumble right i'm used to falling down and when you when you get when you get used to falling down, you end up you end up developing the ability to brace, right? Whether that's like covering your face, uh, making sure your arms go down so you don't like you know, bounce your head off the concrete. There's little things that you do that you kind of clock or making sure if you fall over, you sort of like turn to your side. That's why I've got like you know most guys can attest to you have like scars all over your knees and your elbows and sometimes on your shoulders because you know you're used to a bit of rough and tumble. But when you watch a girl fall over, because girls aren't used to that kind of play, that's not something they grow up with when you're younger, unless you have brothers, of course. But for the most part, girls tend to like push away from that sort of kind of you know recreational activities i don't blame them but when you watch a video of a girl fall over she just lets go just allows the gravity to just take its course doesn't try and cover her face nothing every video you see especially those kind of like homo mimosa kind of clips right where there's a girl at a party and she's a bit tipsy and she falls off a table or something and you just let gravity take them they don't even try and you know turn and twist and sort of like protect their face no just whatever happens happens it's like god damn it woman man protect your face you put all that makeup on you're really pretty you don't end up but you no know, like guys with scars is pretty hot i don't think the girls with scars are the same sort of thing many people start getting afraid of you and stuff and it feels like the government's in the same sort of thing like they don't they're not even trying to fix things they're not even trying to like okay cool we messed up let's try and turn around just just this this morning there's a little clip of michael gove going around where he's saying that uh the interviewer Ask him, oh, do, do you think masks should be mandatory in all shops? He's like, no, they shouldn't be mandatory. People should be people should be allowed to use their own common sense and their own sense of what? Yeah, common sense and manners should be the way to forward in this tyranny in COVID. It's like, I just, again, I'm, I'm, um, I sit on both sides. I understand the need to kind of get the economy back up and running, quote unquote. I understand the need for businesses to reopen. Right, I understand the people the need for people to return their kids back to school or kids to go back to school in general. I get all that. I think it's really important, but I just think if you just would have locked it down really strict in the beginning, you could have been out of the of the weeds by now, right? Is it what's what's that country? Is it Taiwan? They're playing baseball, right? Of course, a blight with masks and stuff, but there's people in the stadium where they're playing baseball in Taiwan, right? Vietnam had zero deaths. New Zealand had really low amount of deaths. I think maybe under 100 or something. It can be done. Now, there people are going to say, oh, but they're islands, or oh, this, this, their economy. It's like, okay, cool. Give me all the, um, give me all the kind of uh, reasons why we can't copy it. But there must be some reasons that, must be some aspects of it that we can copy. Some things they've done well that we can sort of implement. But we don't. It's just interesting. It's just to watch again from the outside in. I've I have no idea what really happens in politics. If there's something above my pay grade, I'm sort of like commenting on. Please forgive I, but I just find it interesting as a civilian to look at. I think these guys don't have a screwy what to do when something goes wrong, do they? They seem to have all the answers, right? Like I mentioned in my previous podcast, that everyone knows what to do when it comes to reopening. When it comes to opening a brand new shopping mall, knows how to cut the ticker tape. You know how to celebrate, uh, uh, you know, an election win. They know how to boast about you know, job numbers. But when it comes to actually handling a crisis, right? Giving people some sort of reassurance, confidence, making them feel safe. They don't know, they don't know anything. Zero. They don't know anything. No, Scooby. Absolutely mad, man. Absolutely mad. Um, But yeah, what can we do? What can we do? Less said about that, the better. So, many topics to talk about. Many things to get through. Um, many things have happened in the whole news uh, cycle this past week, it feels like. From stuff about Jada Pinkett Smith to Jeffree Star to all this sort of malarkey. But I thought I'd start off with a little um, tribute and, you know, a sad bit of news. Unfortunately, um, I want to rest uh, re rest in peace to uh, Fra909. That, that's, who I, that's how I know him by. Um, he's a, I'm, I'm going to basically describe him as a documentarian of the techno scene used to upload loads of videos on youtube from various techno festivals all across europe um he was basically my introduction into the techno scene to be completely honest like i had no i think 
obviously I must have stumbled on maybe a mixed mag magazine or whatever or a, f a couple of RA articles but actually seeing what a techno festival or party looked like I see I saw it through the lens of Fry 909 on or FR 909 on YouTube that's the first time I ever saw anything like that I was just like wow mesmerized like God, look at all these people, these charismatic DJs, the sounds I was hearing. Like it just like it just reverberated off your screen. And that was back in the day when the cameras weren't that great. Um, you know, most of the stuff on these channels like 480p lower, right? It, was, it looks like it was recorded on the Nokia 3210. But <coughs> but it got across the vibe, it got across the feeling of what it must be like to be a part of that community, to be a part of that scene. And again, it just made me want to uh, do my part in it myself right it made me kind of want to get curious and you know attend various warehouse braves and shoreditch and hoxton and stuff back in the day when they had warehouses around those areas um a real real legend man um and unfortunately the news came out when i'm gonna say the other day unfortunately he passed away due to cancer i think he got diagnosed pretty uh, recently and it, unfortunately it was one of those cancers where it just sort of like accelerated and ended up passing away really quickly um but it's, yeah, it's just heartbreaking man he left a tribute message on his facebook page sort of like you know, i think that was when he was first going into treatment for chemo or just before he went into chemo he left a little message talking about um how the treatment was going and his kind of condition at the time and it's heartbreaking to read man knowing that of course that a few days later he passed away but yeah i just want to give just 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 a bit of a tribute to the dude man just kind of go through some hits uh from the youtube channel that i thought were really really influential important to me at the time i clipped something on my twitter the other day which i thought was a really good clip from magda this must have been like i don't know 2007 at love family park if you know anything about techno you'll know what love family park was or still is um but in its heyday sort of like in the early 90s to the early 2000s was sort of like the the quintessential techno festival in i think maine or mainz how you pronounce how you pronounce that in germany um and if anything it kind of for me anyway it was a living embodiment of what i'd imagined the movie berlin calling was because i would always seen clips of berlin calling but i never watched the whole thing but i kind of got the gist of what the whole scene was like but seeing in actual real life kind of through the lens of Fred 909 it really kind of brought it to life i was like jesus christ this is amazing i want to i want a bit of this right and you always have to imagine and i always think to myself especially back then as well i was like okay if if festivals are essentially the lowest common the lowest form the lowest common denominator yeah or, or the lowest form of entry right to get into the scene imagine what the clubs must be like that's what i just imagined myself i was thinking okay if this is the commercial festival that's you know expansive one day festival with thousands of people coming from all over the world to go and attend with some of the biggest djs in the world you know you get flown around in private jets all this malarkey imagine what the underground warehouse events of this same caliber of, of that same sort of kind of music musical style must be like and it just kind of just it just blew my mind i was like okay cool i need to take i need to take part in this and i think it just it must have been it must have been a couple of years after watching the videos of friend and on youtube i took my first trip to berlin my first time going to Bergheim, my first time going to Cookies. Uh, was it Cookies? No, it wasn't Cookies. What was the place I went to? Was it Cookies? I don't think it was Cookies. Maybe it, maybe it was Griesmüller. My first time. I went to Ber Bergheim, Griesmüller. Um, oh, actually, I went to Panorama Bar, actually, I think on a Friday, the first time I went to Berlin. And then the following day, went to Griesmüller, and then on Sunday, went again back to Bergheim. That was like, again, my introduction into it. And I don't think I would have got it unless I watched these videos from Friday or Nine. So this is a video of Magda DJing. This is my little tribute that I put onto, on Twitter that says, uh, R.I.P. to Friday Nine or Nine, original documentarian of the techno scene. Those early 2000 videos are from Love Family Park were everything to me back in the day when I started DJing. My thoughts and prayers go out to his closest family and friends. His legacy lives on. So this is an epic, epic video of Magda playing back in the day. Magda's really underrated, man. And I wonder if it was like a purposeful thing that she did. She she kind of pulled away from the scene, it feels like, right? She had a, re a lot of really big tracks, I can remember, uh, playing out and listening to a lot during that time and some really, really big remixes. But it feels like she purposely took a step back from the limelight. She didn't necessarily want to become, I don't know... I think of, this is a really bad example, but I think I imagine in my head that her and Tiny are the same sort of age range. And if it was like Tiny kind of really took a hold of that whole 
she really kind of stepped into the limelight. She wanted to be a bit more mainstream, right? She was doing loads of parties, lo doing loads of her own promotions, uh, doing all the big festivals, interviews everywhere. But Magda seemed to kind of just like, you know, take a bit of a step back. It obviously was purposeful, I imagine so, but what a great DJ she is, man. An absolute dynamite DJ. <laughs> And wild gift to go back to a rave right now. Look at that. Look how amazing that looks. And I guess that's that's what probably explains my that's probably what explains my love for festivals, maybe. I'm just thinking about it now, having watched these earlier videos. Um, because this was my introduction to the scene. So I have kind of a little bit of a soft spot for festivals. Whereas most of the scene nowadays, it feels like all the cool kids kind of poo-poo festivals. They're like, oh, I don't really like festivals. They're not really a true representation of club culture. It's like, yeah, I know. I never really saw a festival as um, an alternative to going to a club. It was just another thing that was part of the scene, right? Because techno music does work pretty well in this. Because I, I agree. I think playing techno music or playing dance music at a festival like Pat, like uh primavera for instance that i've been to a few times isn't necessarily the best place for it i don't think so because that crowd pro predominantly that crowd is there to see bands and rappers and singers and jazz acts whatever it may be right they're there to see live music they're not there to see like people playing behind a decks or a, p a person playing behind decks it's not really set up the same way for it and the sparseness of the of the of the of the location of primavera um it just doesn't really add itself to a cog to like a really immersive experience that a festival can be but i think when you program in the right way you have in the right setting you have people there that actually understand what the music is about there's a good mix of like heads and casual listeners i think you can get something really really unique and from the festivals i've been to that have been that have smashed it i've done a really good job junction 2 being a good example i think it's a good representation of that it doesn't try to be in a club outside it just it tries to be a place where they can accurately give a platform to this amazing music in an amazing setting and allow people to kind of freely move around from stage to stage i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing really in all in all intents and purposes <laughs> them and then the other clip that i thought was really interesting that, again i'm trying to just trace my timeline of listening to techno music back in the day was this clip of ricardo villalobos now this was maybe again another introduction of for me to the kind of charismatic rock star dj right that um, ricardo villalobos was a, a early hero of mine in djing as was a person uh like dj harvey like jeff mills um was another one I was looking at a lot back in the day. Ba, 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 ba. Do you have a DJ Sneak, DJ Hell, good ones. That's probably it, right? But that kind of charismatic DJ, that sort of like personality behind the scene, behind the deck story, that wasn't just like, you know, morose and sort of like, you know, dull face, uh, wearing all black, just staring down at the, um, at the mixer. That had to be Ricardo Villalobos. He was the first person I actually saw DJing and actually look at the crowd, right? Him and Sven Vav, basically, were the ones that actually interacted with the crowd, like looked around their sort of environment. Because that's what you always hear when you start DJing, right? The first things you hear about beat matching, um, mixing, right? Whether you should not should do, you know, CDJs or fucking vinyl, tired debate. And the other thing you always hear when you're starting to DJ is the ability to read the room. I never understood in the beginning when I used to watch these, you know, industrial really kind of hard techno DJs I used to play in amazing venues they just got up and just kind of just like stared down at the mixer like, like Surgeon is a good example and just played never looked up to the crowd never interacted just came through and just bang 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 I was like what the, what is this like that don't get me wrong I, mean, I get I, I know the, the the crowd must enjoy it but as a I don't know as a DJ or as a casual listener I don't know I want a bit more interaction it's a bit it's a bit of a show no There's, there should be some sort of showmanship towards the DJing part of it right um, and Ricardo Villalobos is a, probably the best example of that, like an absolute showman in the best place possible. Maybe gets a little bit too excited some in some cases, right? Sometimes let the rave get the best of him, but overall, just an, an entire legend when it comes to the ability to captivate a crowd behind the decks, which is not an easy thing to do. 
in my um, experience as well. Let's get a little bit forward there. Oh. This is Ricardo Vera Lobos from Love Family Park in 2010. And this was also my first introduction to like, you know, the overcrowded DJ boofing for the superstar DJs. It's a certain sort of DJ that kind of allows this. If it's a Sven Var, because he's playing vinyl, he doesn't allow anyone to come behind the decks, right? He sort of kind of has it cordoned off. Um, but the sort of superstar DJ in the in the kind of, you know, in the in the in the makings of a Ricardo or Seth Troxler, they kind of feed it feels like they kind of feed off of that kind of yuppie um VIP sort of like beg friend thing behind them. They kind of feed off of it. It actually adds to their performance. Obviously for us on the other side of the crowd we sort of a bit envious and kind of kind of throw daggers at people behind there, like pretending as if they're playing, holding their hands up, trying to g up the crowd. Like their hype man, it could be a bit cringe. But there's also a bit of jealousy, like, oh, I wish we were there as well, innit? So that's the first time I kind of experienced that, like seeing what that was about. And obviously seeing Ricardo, he's like the master of being able to like, you know, interact from around him, throwing around air kisses, hugging randoms, wiping all his sweat everywhere. Crowd. Look at the crowd. And is it any coincidence that most of these outdoor festivals always seem to be next to a place where there's a massive motorway or bridge? I guess because those areas have loads of free space, but it's like a junction, right? There's always these festivals where there's loads of bridges and random things around like motorways and shit. Interesting. So good. Fast forward a bit. Yeah, and of course, the same look. Having a good little kiss behind the decks. You know, just living a life, man. Being an absolute rock star behind the decks. Love it. Love to see it. The showmanship of it all. The sunglasses. And then of course back then as well, I used to think, oh, he's wearing sunglasses to be cool. Then you go to your first festival, you have a little pinger and you realise, oh, this is why people wear sunglasses, right? <laughs> your, your pupils are the size of CDs and you look like an absolute freak. So sunglasses help to give you some sort of um, uh, some sort of impression of normal normalcy, right? When it, whereas, you know, real ravers know what's going on behind those shades. <laughs> And then I think the guy with the long hair supposedly is his manager, who happens to be Sven Vard's brother. Is that true? That's the thing you always hear in comments. Um, of course, legendary Sfra. He didn't, he didn't ever allow comments to be um, enabled on his videos. That was always a big thing. No interaction there, but hey. I'm pretty sure the long haired guy is his manager. I'm pretty sure. Let's fast forward a bit more. But legendary, man. I even still, I even still remember the uh, the little mini fridge of Red Bull behind him. That was a big time. So I remember Red Bull were, act, were basically sponsoring everything that had to do with dance music. Now they're sort of taking a bit of a step back, but you know they were obsessed with dance music, right? From the Red Bull Music Academy to the Red Bull re lecture things they had, they were just slapping their logo everywhere. It kind of feels, even though you know, again, even though um, Boiler Room is sort of like an independent startup, it feels like Boiler Room sort of replaced Red Bull, right? In that kind of respect. They're sort of on the same sort of level. I'd imagine so, right? There's, they sort of represent that kind of corporate um, structure system, I think, right? Maybe some people don't want to appear on Boiler Room because they're a bit naff. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. But what an era, man. What an era. Look at the amount of groupies just hanging around the booth, man. This is, well, it's, it's just such an interesting thing to witness, isn't it? Like, from an outside perspective, like, the the difference in approach in DJing like this but I guess it's, it adds to the vibe in it to be honest if you ask maybe he doesn't even care or doesn't even re realize it but I guess it's part of the mystique it's part of the ambiance right you have all these randoms behind you in the booth 
you, it would be beneficial if, if you know if they're mostly girls that helps i guess but just random people in the booth that kind of get up near you and they're dancing hanging around being all vips smoking smoking bloody copious amounts of cigarettes and doing all other kinds of bits of nonsense and then it kind of gives the crowd this sort of like sense of like wow i wish i was there but i don't know does it do people actually feel like that or are they just busy dancing and having a good time i don't know but yeah interesting to see and then we'll end it with a couple more tribute to Fra. We've got a video from Ellen Allian at Kappa Future Festival, another big one in Italy. This festival is always funny for me to see from the outside in because of just the amount of dudes at this festival. Like, it's just, God damn it. There's a lot of conversations at the moment now on, on Twitter, on Techno Twitter, right? Uh, about the lack of inclusivity. <laughs> There's a lot of conversation at the moment about the lack of inclusivity in the scene, right? Um, there's not enough uh, people of colour that are playing, you know, on big lineups, on big clubs, on big festivals. But then you look at sometimes the attendance of these places, of these festivals and these events, and you're like to yourself, hmm, there might be a reason why these promoters are being so lazy and booking the same 10, 12 people. It's because, you know, the crowd generally doesn't really change over the years. It's the same crowd. Like, look at the videos now of Kappa Future right from 2019 onwards or 2015 onwards and then it's the same like crowd disparity it, the, you know the range in terms of the people that are in the crowd is fairly similar maybe there might be a few other colors in there but for the most part it's strictly caucasian strictly european sort of looking people um nothing else apart from that so sometimes i think to myself it's a bit unfair to expect those promoters to have their finger on the pulse and know who the up and coming DJs are from, you know, outside of their little friendship group. Because to make it, you know, to be completely honest, they're just probably a little bit lazy, isn't it? Like if you're a promoter doing a festival of that scale, the last thing you need to, to, to be doing is to try and to be, is trying to kind of understand what's, who's next, who's bubbling up on the scene. You don't have the time. You just want to book who, you know, sells tickets, who commands a crowd, who plays well, who's no trouble to deal with. That's all you want. You just want to just, you know, you just want the easy way out. So maybe there's an option but then in the other part of it, I also get I also get the need to kind of change that narrative to sort of like sh display to the customers something there might be something they're missing out on to give them a taste of something else right because if they if these festivals are book these techno originators right especially the guys from Detroit then how are they meant to know where the music sort of originated from they're not are they so I don't know man but this video is really interesting just because the amount of dudes. The amount of like pure dudes in the crowd is just nuts, mate. <laughs> Watch as the camera pans across. Look at that. Just just fellas upon fellas upon fellas. Look at that crowd, mate. Just pure cock party. It's like mamma mia. <clears throat> And it'll be alright, but it was a cock party if it was an actual, you know, if it was a gay festival, but it's not. Or a queer festival, it's not. It's just a regular festival for regular cis gendered VP people and look at the look at the crowd. Look at the crowd. But again, really epic. And maybe again, maybe another example of what probably Junction 2's done, and especially their main stage that copy that sort of layout. Because you can see this happening in, in absolutely at Billingsgate Market or something. We have something similar to that in London, a place called Billingsgate Market. They could do something similar to that. But it's so amazing to see. Imagine being a DJ and looking out up front and seeing that amount of people. But then I can also understand why if you're a club person, you could look at that and it could just make your balls want to shrivel up, right? And kind of tuck back into your bum. Because that doesn't represent a club to you. That's like the complete opposite of a nightclub, right? But... God, that must... I, I think everyone should... I think maybe everyone should have the ability to do that for one, once in their career. Just be able to play in front of a crowd like that. Just to kind of see how it feels. Because I wonder how the sound even travels. Like, does the sound even get that far back? Like, what do they do with the speaker? Like, it's just insane. It really is insane. And how many people are actually in that crowd? Is it like 100,000? Is it 10,000? It's just mad. Mad, mad, mad. <laughs> Pour a bit over here, and of course, Ellen Allen doing her thing, performing behind the booth. She's another one too. Doesn't really like having a lot of people behind her. It seems like for the most part. I think it's a. To be honest, it must be a little bit of an uncomfortable thing, especially if you're a girl. 
in the scene. It must be really weird to have loads of... Because it's already annoying anyway to be in the scene, right? <laughs> to be surrounded by loads of dudes in the first place. Then to be uh, uh, to be performing somewhere and have loads of dudes that you don't know standing behind you as you play your stuff it must be super uncomfortable. So it seems that for the most part, you never really see a girl in the scene have a sort of like circo loco crowd behind her in the same vein as all those guys that play at DC10. It doesn't really happen that often. But maybe the, maybe the new ones are, I don't know, but yeah. She's kind of enjoying herself there. And then a last one before we move on to the next topic, tribute to Fra, we have a video of Seth Troxler actually playing from Fra. And again, go, go check him out, man. Like an absolute king of the scene. Fra909, that's F-R-A-909. Check out all these videos, watch them all. It's, if you really want to understand what, you know, what the scene's about, what festivals are about, what the techno music is about, give yourself a bit of a history lesson, check out those videos, honestly. And then, you know, do a bit of research in your own time. But some of these videos are absolutely legendary, man. Especially at the time period, I sort of saw them. Let's skip forward a bit. And again, look at look at that crowd behind Seth. Look at the crowd. Just, you won't be again unless he had headphones. You won't be able to tell who's actually DJing. It's insane the amount of people there. It just make it just eesh. it's too many people for me, man. I can't do it. A couple of friends here, but look at the people. Someone's on their phone. Someone's monging off. But look at that. Look. History lesson. History. History. Two thousand and twelve, Seth. And this is back in the day when you used to use um, what do you call it? Is it, is it Serato, right? Serato box with the vinyl. You don't really see people doing that nowadays anymore. It was a big thing. It felt like in a bit, and maybe it was because people didn't want to burn CDs. Probably, is right. It's a cheap method. You 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 whack up Tractor or Serato on your laptop. You have one of those boxes that you plug in. It's a really complicated solution. You plug it into your turntables and the mixer. Then you get these bits of vinyl that will basically you use to sort of manipulate the sound, kind of like a MIDI controller, but you put them on vinyl turntables look more legit. And it was a really big thing in the scene back in the days, let's say in that kind of during that era, let's say early two thousand to mid two thousand or yeah, early two thousand to two thousand ten and upwards, like that was a thing that everyone used. And Seth was kind of one of the people that used to do it a lot. And it, I, I don't know, I just didn't like the look of it because it like using a, a MIDI controller in a club, you're always kind of on your laptop. It just looks a bit weird, isn't it? You're kind of, it always kind of disengages you from actually feeling the room and sort of kind of being at one with what you're doing. It, you always kind of constantly dragged away. And then and the other thing too that I hate about it is that you have your entire library at your fingertips when you're using a laptop, which isn't necessarily the best approach to constructing a coherent DJ set. You kind of need to constrain yourself somewhat by having a crate, having a small selection of songs, CDs, whatever it may be. So, um, but yeah, just interesting to see him using that system. Especially in this setting with so many sweaty people around, right? The needle probably warping and skipping everywhere. This for the other bit. Yeah. There's a drink there right behind the deck, it's like, the deck is a mess, isn't it? What a great era, man. But yeah, RIP from I'll end it for now. But I guess a lot of DJs too will be, you know, posting their condolences because I think he did contribute a lot to a lot of people's successes. He allowed, you know, that again, if you're when you're the first person to document that sort of stuff, especially behind the booth, um, you know, these short ten to twelve minute clips of people playing in places. Again, for me, myself hanging, you know, I was a little kid watching these videos on a shitty laptop of my mum's house in custom house. To see those videos, I was like, wow, man, this is amazing. I want to be part of this. I can only imagine what it must have done for the DJ's careers in terms of fans going to buy their music, attending the clubs they were going to play at. No, it's just incredible, man. So, yeah, RIP to Fra. Um, shout out to his family and stuff. And, yeah, you will not be forgotten, my friend. You will not be forgotten. Let's move on now onto other topics. Ba ba ba. Ooh, in news that I generally wouldn't care about, but I think is really interesting in terms of understanding the role that influencers and you know public figures play within social media nowadays and within current culture we have 
breaking news, which you probably heard already, but Morphe have finally dropped Jeffree Star. Right? This is a big deal. This is a big deal. This is a big deal. Because the last few weeks, we've had a lot of drama, right? We had Tatty Westbrook coming back out again with a video, crying and explaining why she decided to throw her friend under the bus and essentially excuse him of, you know, some very inappropriate behavior with minors, right? She insinuated the fact or basically kind of put it out there that she was afraid this was going on. And even though James Charles at the time was her friend, she thought the best way to sort of warn him about a situation was to sit down and make a video. So the backlash from that is just kind of rumbled on. It hasn't necessarily stopped. And we have this issue where, you know, we have like conflicting issues happening at the same time, right? We have videos of Jeffree Star resurfacing from old where he's using, you know, the N-word and other sort of, you know, slurs and being a bit of a dick that he was back in the day. We have videos of Shane with his edgy humor that was never edgy and just super offensive um, resurfacing. We have Jeffrey, no, yeah, then we have Tati Westbrook with her explanation, essentially telling everybody that Shane Dawson and Jeffree Star manipulated her, quote unquote, into making that uh, by Sisters video in the first place. And then we have all these fans just just like waiting to see who gets cancelled first right like just waiting in the like who's gonna get cancelled and i guess from my point of view being an outsider i'm just kind of viewing everything um it always surprised like it, it's genuinely surprising to me anyway at least right how much it's generally surprising to me how loyal social media stars fan bases are to their you know person they never drop them like, it never really happens, usually, for the most part. Like, I look at someone like Onyissian as a good example. No matter how many videos people put up of him being an absolute jerk, a bit of a creepo, he just always kind of steamrolls through it. Um, Keemstar is a good example. Like, it seems that like the more reprehensible you are online, it's actually the better, because at least people then, at least your fans know exactly who you are. And I think the detractors don't necessarily understand that. And the people that, quote-unquote, they term as haters, they don't understand that, I think what's happening here is that Jeffrey Star, James Charles, no, Jeffrey Star and Shane Dawson's fans, actual fans, they know who they are as people. They're not surprised at these videos. They've seen those videos. They've come to peace with those videos. They accept that if you want to be a fan of Jeffrey Star, you have to accept his um, and Shane Dawson. You have to accept their checkered past. It's part of it, right? But part of the beauty of being a fan of somebody on social media is that if you just keep watching their videos, you're going to enable them to make more videos, right? It's not like supporting your favorite. It's not like supporting somebody on TV. If the show gets taken off air through no fault of their own, you've essentially lost the ability to communicate or see that person again, right? But in this case, the control is being put back in, the control is right back into the hands of the sort of audience and the content producers or the content, yeah, yeah, the content makers. As long as you're making the content, as long as people resonate with it, you've got a career. And I think that really pisses off a, a particular subsect of people who, still have this idea that people can get cancelled in the conventional way. Because I think if you're operating conventional media, if you're somebody that's on a major network, you're, you, there's more chance of you getting cancelled because cancelled is basically losing your job. But in the internet world, it's very difficult to get cancelled because, unfortunately, YouTube, Google, all these sort of places, they're kind of in bed with Shane and Jeffree Star because they enable those guys to make more money, which they then divvy up to these people in terms in the in the aspects of Google AdSense, right? So it's within their best interest to remain pretty hands off with everything and allow the market to decide who gets a career and who doesn't get a career because it benefits their bottom line. And I think sometimes what it looks like for me from what's happening here is that without saying it, people are basically saying that they want uh, platforms that Google like YouTube, like Twitter, like Facebook, to basically take control and decide who gets a platform and who doesn't get a platform. And I think that's very dangerous. I think we should allow everyone free speech, um, you know, to a certain extent. But then I also think there needs to be more onus placed on the actual people that are watching this video. We need to take more responsibility. It happens a lot. Remember when that K-pop star uh, unfortunately uh, committed suicide and um then it kind of came out because i wasn't paying attention i forgot who it was uh please forgive me for not remembering their name but i remember it being a big deal because this particular person was bullied relentlessly online via trolls right constantly kind of mocked about their appearance and blah blah and they were you know and again the fans didn't know that that person was already a little bit mentally fragile right they already had gone through some issues so maybe they're a bit more susceptible to feeling down at the notion of somebody random person on the internet calling them names but essentially the fans caused this person to push themselves to an extent where they had to commit suicide that's the plain facts of it now people will argue with it one don't want to argue with it but they contributed some aspect towards it right 
But then when that happens, people on the internet, cause especially the people, the trolls that deal with that kind of things, will currently like, oh, be completely hands off. No, that wasn't me. You can't say that. Um, everyone because is in control of their own life, where they're friends, or they'll do that really horrible thing where they start sending out condolences when, you know, just a, a second ago you were berating them online for them misspeaking or something. So I think we need to put more onus on the fans. We need to shine the light back around who are these people who keep consistently buying Jeffree Star's products, watching Shane Dawson's videos, accepting all his apologies. Who are these people? And we need to ask them exactly what's going on there. That's what we need to do. And we need to say, okay, if you want to cancel somebody, you don't cancel them by taking away their Twitter. You don't cancel them by taking away their Facebook and whatever. You should just stop supporting the product they put out. And slowly but surely, they'll just fizzle out and die anyway. I don't understand why that isn't a thing. I don't understand why the bit, people don't have the ability to just like turn over to another channel. I don't get it. I think the Jeffree Star and James Charles thing with Shane Dawson is a bit weird in that, you know, the fact that it was kind of broadcast to the public. I think it should have never, that, it should have happened like that in the first place. It should have just kept their counsel privately and sort of communicated because essentially if it, what it boils down to was that Tate Westbrook felt a bit of a way because James Charles this like young 18, 19 I don't know how, he was at, how old he was at the time kid was essentially starting to feel himself right he was getting a little bit he was getting a little bit you know big headed he was kind of you know giving her the cold shoulder kind of big timing a bit and she felt a little bit away by it right which is understandable you've been, you've been in the industry for many plus years decades whatever it may be you've got a bit of clout you essentially tried to take him under your wing you tried to be a mother figure but then he kind of pushed away like I don't need a mother I'm, I can do this on my own I get why you would feel annoyed by it but to allow that situation to then sort of mushroom into you accusing him of essentially pedophilia is insane that's insane right and that's the issue that's at hand there why didn't these adults they're all adults don't don't, don't start you know attacking tatty oh because she's 40 years old no they're all adults why didn't all these adults who were supposedly friends why couldn't they just come together and just discuss this issue openly in open format like hey i'm your friend i feel like you're being you're, you're acting away you're doing this you're saying that jeffrey said that just talk openly but they don't why because it's hollywood it's la it's social media these friendships are stupid are superficial we've seen it happen with the Chris D'Elia situation right how do Chris D'Elia's friends feel now the allegations have sort of dried up there's no real substance in most of them for the most part Chris D'Elia is guilty of what being a sex pest being too horny uh trying to sm smash everything that moves trying to hook up with every girl that likes his picture that's what he's really guilty of right being way 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 too debt hungry to you know lay pipe instead of like you know do stand up in the various towns he visits that's it but in the beginning they were trying to suggest that he was essentially trying to procure underage girls while she's on tour when that's not true he's a old he's a younger dude in his early 40s that likes to smash girls under 21 years of age i think most guys in that position probably do especially because he's one of the only comedians especially i think in that scene who essentially has girl fans anyway have you seen some of the new york comics some of the guys that appear on legion of skanks no offense they don't look like Chris D'Elia, right? They don't necessarily get, they don't necessarily have teenage girl fans. He's the only guy that does. So he can be excused to get a little bit excited. Now, should he be more of a gentleman? Should he have taken a bit more of an adult approach to the situation? Should he have treated the girls with a bit more respect? Because that's exactly what you see too in that situation with Chris D'Elia. Sorry to kind of interject here. But Chris D'Elia's situation, what you see essentially is he was an absolute dick to those girls, right? There was a, a few stories that some girls kind of, put out there where they agreed to make me up with him at his show and go to the green room but he essentially cold shouldered them he didn't talk to them he was just on his phone the whole time and then when the show was over he immediately just tried to hook up he didn't even try to foreplay just straight away going to third base right that's when you're being a bit of a douche right treat girls with a bit of respect and you know they'll treat you with respect also right they'll be quick to kind of defend your honor but he didn't but that's the most situation was and then as soon as allegations come up you got brendan Schaub and brian kellen crying on camera because like as if their friend is a serial killer or something like what people you know unfriending him on instagram brian callan deleting pictures of him on his feed like come on man like what's going on here same with the situation with jeffree star and james charles if you're james charles friend why don't you talk to him first and understand what's going on give him a bit of you know if that's your actual friend talk to him find out what's actually going on but they don't do that and they broadcast it to the world and then the fans are sat there waiting and the fans are in an awkward position because they're like, okay, should I keep supporting this person or not? I think you should do whatever you feel is best. If with all the information you have available, if you've seen everything that Shane Dawson's done in his parts and you can generally sit there and say, you know what, I'm okay with it because he's a different person now. Cool. You should, you should be allowed to support him if you want. 
if that's what you generally feel like as an adult, you come to that conclusion, even if you're a child, whatever, you have all that information to hand, you've seen all the old videos, you've seen all these racy jokes and these kind of, you know, um, race baiting humor that he used to kind of always do, which was, you know, never really, he just, to be honest as well, I don't really find his comedy offensive. I just found it really bad. He he wasn't really, he was, which is, makes him really, uh, which you now explains why Shane Dawson has done so many pivots in his career. He's trying to essentially find his voice in YouTube and, you know, he's probably got it now. Um, and obviously it looks like he might have lost it, but um, the comedy was just horrible. He's not funny. It's all well and good making, taking the piss out of black people, Asian people, whatever it may be, but just at least be funny, right? I think you get spews that way. If you're funny at least, but he's not funny. He's just not a funny dude. Um, that kind of self-deprecating, I'm poor humor, my mental health sort of stuff, it kind of gets tiring over a while, isn't it? That's essentially what he's turned into now with, with a sprinkling of, of the of the conspiracy videos. But there's part of me that feels a little bit sorry for him too because Shane Dawson's also kind of turned himself into this platform where he essentially rescued people's career, right? You look at someone like a Tanner, you look at somebody like a, like a Jeffree Star. He's really good at kind of reshaping the narrative of people, right? Even the stuff that he did with them, uh, Jake Paul I think right that video he did with him about oh, is he a sociopath or whatever which kind of made people like him more in a little bit right if that was actually possible and now look these same people are completely quiet they're not supporting him they're not really going out there and saying that he's their friend and they're going to support him through whatever he's going through they're all kind of like hands off right arms distance it's really disgusting to see that and then Jeffree Star as well he disappeared out no he's gone he's disappeared but now we're probably going to hear from him because Morphe have dropped him that news came out the other day. Morphe have removed or are in the process of removing all Jeffree Star cosmetics from their store, which is a big deal because people only really, it feels like in the makeup world, people only really heard of Morphe through their affiliations and uh, brand deal and sponsorships with really leading MUA influencers on YouTube. It feels like it. I don't think people are really that au fait with the name um, Morphe prior to that. It was synonymous with like your favorite YouTuber that does makeup. And now they've sort of like split ways um, with Jeffree Star. This is an article from Cosmopolitan sort of like breaking down some issues. It says Morphe announced that they are cutting ties with Jeffree Star following the controversy. It says here that Morphe have announced that they are cutting ties with Jeffree Star and are no longer selling his products uh, following the recent controversy surrounding the entrepreneur in YouTube beauty community. Jeffree and fellow YouTuber Saint Dawson were recently accused by Taylor Swift of manipulating her into posting her biased video about James Charles in May 2019 tight Westbrook as well man like it takes some responsibility my dear she's such a like uh, or maybe it's her personality as well maybe that's it maybe she's just got that kind of personality where regardless of her age she's just easily led you could convince Tati to do anything it feels like for the most part but god mighty man like oh, okay your, your two of your friends are telling you your other friend might be a bit of a creep can you at least speak to him is that possible send him a text an email if you're awkward about speaking on the phone it continues. It says, um, meanwhile, Jeffrey's longtime friend, uh, Tab, recently claimed Jeffrey had made a host of racist and derogatory and offensive comments. In addition, an image of Jeffrey, including swastika symbol, was circulated, which has since been was yeah since apologized for. Morphe's decision to comes after Shane Dawson's conspiracy collection with Jeffrey Star Cosmetics seemingly became no longer on sale. Morphe website causing speculation that it had been removed in the wake of the CERN scandal surrounding Shane. However, Morphe have not confirmed or denied their claims. Morphe explained the decision to cut ties with Jeffrey, writing a statement on Twitter saying. Today we have made a decision to create to cease all commercial activity related to Jeffree Star and affiliated products. We expect this to conclude within the next coming weeks. As we look to the future, we will continue to share updates on what lies ahead for Morphe Brand. Now, I think in terms of cancellation, if a brand you're working with, a corporation decides to cut ties with you based on the things you say in public, fine. But I think more owners should be put on the actual viewership. Why are you supporting somebody that says these things time and time again, involved in t controversy after controversy, uh, always apologizing, always seems to be involved in some sort of scandal or drama? Why do you keep supporting him? That's the issue that I hand it. You look at people like Katana Bogo, you look at someone like a Trisha Paytas, pretty apprehensive, pretty repulsive characters in general, from my point of view, right? I don't know how people can watch that kind of content. I just don't get it. But they're very successful. Now, part of the reason is because the fans actually think they're funny. Or no, part of the reason could be they're actually good at what they do. They're actually talented at what they do. They have a way of engaging and creating content and, you know, being charismatic in front of camera that people just can't seem to pull themselves away from. And I think you should be allowed to keep watching it if that's the fact. But don't turn around and tell me the best solution to kind of get these people off the platform is to put the responsibility back into the hands of someone like a YouTube 
or a Google or a Twitter and say, hey, you should delete people. You should cancel people. You should deplatform people. No, it should be up to the fans. If the fans don't want to watch you anymore because you keep making too many mistakes, they should be allowed to end your career if need be because those are the people that you're playing towards, not YouTube, not those platforms. I don't think we should give those platforms that kind of power. We should allow them only to be facilitators, right? Provide you with a platform to do certain things. They have their terms of services that you need to kind of abide by. But saying that they should decide who gets to say something or not is insane. That's ridiculous. And again, it just it puts you're kind of excusing the responsibility of the fans. You're excusing, you're kind of absolving them of any responsibility because, honestly, like if you watch that, if you watch those, if you've got, if you've gone through that thread of Shane Dawson's um, past, um, you know, errors back in the day, and you could generally say you're still a fan of him, then I question your sanity. But you're allowed to watch him. If you generally have watched those videos of Jeffrey Star from maybe Jeffrey Star's a bit longer in the tooth in terms of when those things occurred but if you can generally stand a personality like jeffrey star then i question your i question your motives or your moral compass too but i understand if you want to be a fan i get it the issue is these people sitting around wanting i don't know everyone to cancel everyone it's like and i and, and part of me also thinks as well like jeffrey star is unfortunately just too big of an entity to cancel in at this case at this point jeffrey star cosmetics I, i'd hate to even imagine what that kind of what that brand does annually in terms of sales so let's say he, he, his YouTube gets deleted and he can still sell tons of makeup to people that don't give us stuff about the YouTube drama. Again, I think it's, it should be such a, it should be a teachable moment this, you know, to tell people to kind of mind their own business, to kind of support their friends, to, you know, keep things, you know, out of public, to sort of, you know, uh, pull up their friends if they make a mistake. But instead it's turned into this whole weird cancellation drama thing. It's just bizarre. Why, like, whereas what for me looking at it from the outside point of view I'm just thinking why have these group of friends who have made a lot of money together who are very successful who have an adoring fan base collectively right and separately why were they unable to sort this issue out behind the scenes why couldn't they just talk to each other if they're so close why couldn't they do that why did they have to broadcast it everywhere and make it so messy because I think fans are allowed to keep if you want to keep regurgitating clips of Shane Dawson saying race, ra uh, racist stuff and Jeffree Star, you know, saying some really racy stuff too. Fair enough. You're allowed to do that. Fans can do what they want. But why can't these people just talk to each other and sort issues out like grown-ups? Why does it all have to descend into, you know, mudslinging and innuendos and gossip and rumours? It's so bizarre. It's so bizarre. Especially when, I don't know, we all make mistakes, right? We all make errors, but I don't know. Talk to your friends first about it. Because if... The, if <sighs> Because if everyone else cancels you, who do you really have, right? That's a problem as well. They wrap their world, they, they kind of wrap themselves up in this kind of YouTube Hollywood life and then they don't necessarily go to the depths of trying to talk to or communicate to their friends. So then when something does go wrong, who do you, who do you have? Really, really bizarre situation, man. But yeah, Morpheus dropped Jeffree Star. Let's see what happens next going forward. Well, I set to see some kind of statement from Jeffree. It'll probably be a... <coughs> a surface announcement not much depth to it he'll probably try and spin it in a way that he usually does but be interested to see what happens going forward because i my assumption or my guess would be jeffrey star never says anything because i don't i just don't think he can say anything like what's he going to say at this point in time there's too much time has elapsed um he hasn't this he, he was obviously shown he doesn't care about his friend jeff shane dawson um he's obviously shown he doesn't necessarily care about the allegations that have kind of sprung up up scram scram sprung back up um, he won't really accept the responsibility because that's not really his personality. So I don't think he's he's gonna need to explain himself or he wants to. He'll make he might just dance around it and just say like girl and all that sort of stuff, right? He won't really answer any questions or really get to the bottom of it. I don't think so. Shane Dawson's nothing he can do either because I just think people don't necessarily like him. I think people are just annoyed that he's got a career still. So he's gonna perpet he's he's gonna be in this perpetual kind of purgatory can cancellation purgatory where whenever he does a m misstep someone's going to resurface the clips of him you know it's trying to wank you know in front of a picture of willow they're going to resurface the clips of him in brown face blackface it's just going to keep happening because no one likes him and then james charles is effectively has been the one that's won out the whole situation because he's come out he's looking you know even better than he did previously essentially you know it, essentially it boils down to jealousy right they were getting jealous of this guy they didn't want him to get the success that he was clearly going to get he was on a real upward trajectory at that point in time right he's going he was going off like an absolute rocket they went to sort of like you know uh dim his light a little bit and it kind of worked right they essentially accused him of the one thing that you know when you get accused of it sort of sticks with sticks to you like mud it's really hard to kind of get it off 
and he's still suffering the consequences of it now. That's the thing that's really mad about it. No one seems to have, no one seems to really be talking about the fact that James Charles was, was basically accused of being a pedophile. And it still kind of haunts him to this day. Anytime he kind of likes a picture of someone that looks a little bit underage, people are always in the comments saying stuff, screenshotting it. It's like, God damn it, man. But hey, what can you do? Moving on in. Ba, 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 ba. Um, oh, yeah. Um, Jada Red Table Talk. Mama mia. Oh, let me scratch my leg a little bit. Jada Red Table Talk. Did you watch it? Did you see the the clip that went around the world that re reverberated around various different scenes? I think that was... It's interesting to see sometimes... Sometimes some events on social media seems to capture everybody's imagination or events or gossip or kind of, you know, celebrity stories. And this is one of them, right? It seemed to capture black Twitter, political Twitter, um, news Twitter, work Twitter. Everyone was talking about this situation, right? Which it, it basically stemmed from August Alcina went on this radio sh or talk show with Angela Yee where without being prompted really that hot aggressively, he basically divulged that he was in a relationship with uh, Jada Pinkett Smith, Will Smith's wife, and that somehow he also or said quite clearly that Will Smith gave him permission to essentially sleep with his wife, which basically perpetuated this rumor or the suggestion that the Smiths were in some kind of swinging uh, poly polygamous polygamy, yeah, polygamy, polygamy, polygamous relationship that people have been kind of rumoring about for a while um, on all the kind of forums or whatever they may be and on Twitter and other places it's sort of been the assertion that they have a bit of an open relationship and he perpetuated that um the, obviously everyone was kind of astounded by it they didn't really understand what's going on loads of debate and then JD Pinkett Smith came out and said hey I'm going to put myself to the red table and sort of talk about these issues and essentially we got that video the other day 12 minutes only it wasn't a bit shorter than what they usually do um loads of cuts and edits here and there but the general um kind of impression i got from it was that you know Jaden and will smith obviously have a very solid relationship they have a very solid uh, marriage um something that you could only cultivate through years and years of suffering and turmoil and you know laughs and you know and all that sort of stuff it's, it looks like they've been for a lot together as a couple so this is just another you know another notch in their experience belt um but it also made me think you know what august Asina comes out of this looking the worst he does because it's very um it's very um unbecoming of a man to kind of um kiss and tell. I don't think it's ever a good thing for a dude to sort of like brag or to put out a woman's business like that. I think if a woman wants to talk about how small your penis is and whatever maybe she's within her place to do so. Women have the kind of carte blanche to be as bitchy and as vindictive as they want because it's kind of within their nature and it's the only thing they can do to get back at you, right? If you kind of do something wrong to them what else can they do right they can't beat you up as much as they want to so the only thing they can do is sort of like throw mud on your name that's fair you should have to just take it on the chin i think engaging in sort of like back and forth with women and calling them out on their name or saying really derogatory things about women in public i don't think that's on at all um especially when you get really detailed and, and in depth with it it just makes guys look like you just look like a you just look really cucky it just doesn't really look good on men so i think in that respect when i first saw Augustina talking about um, his relationship with Jada Pinkett Smith, he just rubbed me up the wrong way. Like, why would he be talking about it? Why would he put this out in the open? Then the more he started to speak about it, the more I started to see how he kind of carried himself. My initial impression was that what actually happened was he kind of essentially took, no, no, maybe he took advantage or he was taking advantage of a sort of rift in their relationship. Um, she needed a little bit of a new spark in her life. They connected, they hooked up and he caught feelings. Like what happens a lot with dudes, I think it doesn't necessarily get spoken about often enough, but guys catch feelings probably a lot quicker than girls do and probably uh, a lot more often than girls do, but they don't necessarily talk about it. They always try and brush it off when it doesn't work out. Like, oh, that girl wasn't nothing anyway. I didn't really care about her. But guys do catch feelings. I've had been in that position myself where you've gone on holiday, you hooked up with somebody, it's magical, you're spending, you know, every day with each other. It feels like you've been together for a year, but it's like three days that you met this person at a villa somewhere and you just, you know, you're inseparable. And then you get back home and you try and rekindle that relationship and it never actually goes there, right? It never can, you can never rekindle what happened prior. It just, just doesn't feel the same um and i felt that happened to me a few times right and it's hard to take it's a hard pill to swallow that suddenly the person that you were allowed to touch and feel up upon suddenly just doesn't want you anywhere near them there's like you know what that, that, yeah there's, there's nothing worse to a man's ego than that that then you know you had the ability to touch this person and kiss them and then suddenly they just say no 
enough. I don't want you to touch me anymore. Don't come near me. Don't talk to me. It's like, oh, it can really hurt you, right? It can be a real blow to your ego, a real blow to your confidence. But that's part of life. It is what it is. But I think in some situations, it's also very, very clear where you sit in terms of the hierarchy of relationship. Like where you, like sometimes it doesn't really get spoken about either as well. But as a dude, maybe it's a, yeah, maybe it's a dude thing. I think dudes are, are realistic, for the most part, when they get in relationship with girls, dudes are able to see. There's a common joke that dudes, ha you know, you get with your friends where they're like, "Oh, if they meet up, if they meet your girl for the first time, and she happens to be super attractive, like, rah, you, you're batting above your, you, you're, you're, you're batting, you're batting out, you're batting above your weight, right? Yeah, or something, yeah, whatever it may be, right? Um, and we say that to each other because we generally know where we sit in terms of the level of attractiveness scale right in terms of our partner we know when we look across the bed we're like rah i shouldn't be i shouldn't be smashing this girl i'm actually grateful she's allowing me to because i have no i have no right to be anywhere near her flipping um sphere aura right i have no right to be anywhere near her right i should be lucky that i even get to breathe the same air as this person we know that intrinsically but i think girls have this bit of delusion about them where they can sometimes be a bit like you know i don't know i think sometimes Ugly girls can really think they're really beautiful, which is fine, which is great, do that. But they can sometimes delude themselves into thinking that, you know, I don't know, that they are as beautiful as their really attractive model hu husband or something, when it's not necessarily the case. So I think because of that, um, we can also get delude, we can, we can maybe get whipped a bit more easier, I think, guys. Maybe that's what I'm saying. I think it's a good example. So if a guy ends up hooking with a girl that's way above his batting average, he can get hooked, he can get whipped a little bit more easier because he sometimes can give himself this narrative in his head over a period of time that oh she must be with me because actually i'm not ugly i'm hot i'm not repulsive i'm actually really attractive right that could be something that you could keep telling yourself and in the moment that person says no it's all like well, it's all like a jolt to the system like well i'm back in reality again so i think that's what happened to august alcina um and again i don't necessarily I, I just this is the thing i just can't get out of my head like why did this why why did he ever think that she was but maybe i don't know again we don't know what happened situation they might be in that at that time when because obviously it transpired from red table talk jada pickett smith said will smith and her had broken up at the time that's why her and august Asina were together but maybe at that time it really honestly did look like jada and will smith were going to separate so august would be in his right to believe that he had the chance to essentially be with jada pinkett smith for a long period of time you know to somehow be uh you know um jaden smith's stepdad and stuff right maybe he wanted that that's what he actually wanted he wanted to be a part of their family um but if i was him and i was in that situation i would just been grateful that I had the opportunity to kind of hook up with her in the first place right it was just a once in a lifetime opportunity you can't necessarily look too long term in it especially with somebody like will smith do you know what i mean like do you, and i guess that's the other part of it is this if you're a dude like from a dude perspective it, it must be crushing to know that your partner hooked up with somebody else but again you're on a break you're not together so she can do what she wants but then to find out it's somebody like an august it's just like what and that's something i've always kind of wondered like what like it's really interesting that sometimes the most attractive of females um, who end up hook, who end up hooking up with or cheating on their partner with somebody else always end up going for the most corniest of dudes. Corny dudes always win in a really, really high level way. And normal kind of chill dudes like Will Smith can never really understand that. You can never kind of process in your head like, you hooked up with that dude? I understand we're on a break and we do whatever you want, but that's the guy you end up going with. That's the guy that you got us kind of like parading our business on TV about and on social media and had us talking on this red table. You had him, August. It must be so crushing. Um, and I guess for Jada too, there must be a little bit of regret, a little bit of buyer's remorse. Like, God damn it, man. He was young and it was a nice fling, but was it really worth it to have this August guy put all your business out there? Like... Really, really, again, interesting situation because usually when this stuff happens, when it's a side piece speaking up about, you know, some sort of uh, relationship drama, it's usually everyone's sympathies laid with the side piece, right? Yo, you kind of led he or she astray, you manipulated the situation. But in this instance, because of the star power, because of the popularity, because of the um, affection that we have for the Smiths, somehow August has seen us come out and it's looking at the worst, not the Smiths, right? Whereas you could actually look at generally from an objective point of view and say the Smith probably took advantage of this kid, right? He came in mentally broken, physically broken. And he needed the shoulders of crowd, needed family to take him in and show him what real love was. They finagle the situation in the way that they do. And somehow they've kind of spit him back out. And now he's kind of been left out to the wolves. 
you could look at it that way, but there's not. Everyone sort of has sympathy for Will, for Jada, has sympathy even for Will about stuff he's put up with. When really, you know, you look at you know if you if you get a magnifying glass and take a look at some of Will's alleged extra extra uh, extra marital activities, you can say you know he didn't necessarily come out of it losing either. But it's just funny, man. Like, you really have to pick your battles and this sort of stuff, man. I don't know what all, because I've seen a one of that is. If it was to promote an album, it didn't work because I haven't listened to it, right? Like, I've completely been turned off by the guy. Anyone that, again, any dude that kind of goes around bragging about who they're... Because even when I was in school, it was always corny. It was never cool to be like, oh, yeah, I smashed her. I did this. We've, I fingered in a park. It's like, what are you doing? Like, I don't care about that sort of stuff. We kind of... We kind of um, we kind of knew if you did do it anyway, we kind of assumed you going off in a bush with this girl or going behind a shed somewhere that something was going to happen sexually. You don't need to tell us. You don't need to kind of describe in detail how she quivered in your arms with this sort of stuff. It's just yucky. Like, what are you doing? Like, have some respect. You know what I mean? Um, so when some when a guy does that and kind of puts a girl's business out there like that, I just think, all right, cool, innit? it? You, you stay over there. Like and 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 that probably explains why August Asina looks like the kind of guy that doesn't really have a lot of guy friends. There's, he's a kind of he's a, he's a kind of equivalent of a girl that way. You know those kind of girls are like, oh, I don't really have any girlfriends, and you find out that they are raging whores. I think it's fair to say that also seen as that kind of dude too, right? Like if you're a girl, you have to be really careful about hooking up with him because if it goes wrong, he's gonna tell everybody, everybody what happened, right? And if you're a boy and you get and you get too close to him, he's also gonna tell every girl in your or everybody in your social group about the issues you're having with your girl if you open up to him. Absolute liability, man. Absolute liability. But yeah, um, interesting situation nonetheless. It kind of, you know, resolved it itself. It looks like that actual relationship happened years ago. August seems to be still hung up on it, which kind of goes a, goes a, goes a long way to say just how beautiful of a person Jada Pinkett Smith is on the outside and the inside that this guy is still talking about it and still cut up about it it's years and years later. Um, their marriage looks like it's going stronger than ever. And anything, it's a, maybe a lesson to... Maybe it's a kind of an expose in terms of what it means to be in a celebrity marriage and relationship, innit? There, there needs to be an acceptance or an understanding that what you would accept if you were a regular couple and what you'd accept if you're a normal couple, it's just different, innit? It just has to be. This is why I have a lot of sympathy with somebody like a Colleen Rooney. She gets a lot of stick online, but that woman is an absolute saint. She's an absolute soldier, right? It's how she's held that family together through all the madness that Wayne Rooney's done over the years. Like she's she's the, she's the constant kind of like she's the she's the she's the one that holds that family together. Yeah, she is. She's the actual linchpin. If it if it transpired, touch wood, that's happened. But if you heard a story girl out there that you know they were divorcing and she was getting everything, you would be like, yeah, she deserves it. She actually deserves it legitimately. What she had to put up with. She's raising what three, four kids, having Wayne Rooney running around doing all sorts of madness, drink driving, smashing nannies. Like, absolute mad stuff, yeah? Getting knocked out in kitchens and stuff. Like, mad stuff. And she just made, remained solid, steadfast. And I'm sure if they were, like, a regular, regular family, they probably would have broken up a long time ago. But when you're a celebrity guy and you're entangled together, yeah? That's the, 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 the phrase of the interview. But when you're entwined in that sort of way and your, you know, your lives are public and all that stuff, it just needs to, they, it, you just need to accept there's going to be things that's going to happen that you just need to kind of put up with. Whether it be extramarital affairs, whether it be you know antisocial behavior, just you're just gonna have to pop up with a lot more, just because you're public figures. You just can't bail and run. It just isn't gonna, because that's the problem. You bail and because because the press is so intrusive, right? You split up with your partner due to something they've done that's abhorrent, and he just keep hounding you. Harvey Weinstein's wife is a good example. Her, his ex-wife, right? Um, a well-regarded fashion designer in her own right. She splits up with him straight after the allegations of him come out and he gets charged. But people are still hounding her for stories. They still won't leave her alone. So it just keeps following you around. So you're, sometimes you're better off just like staying with the person and just deciding, you know what? I'm going to stay. That's probably what... Um, who's, who's that guy? Is it Les Moonves? Who's a dude from CNB? Some dude. I've got his name. Maybe it's him. He's got like an Asian wife who kind of, you know, stead, she kind of uh, stepped down from her role on TV station and just said, I'm going to stand with my husband. I don't care what you say. He's my husband. I'm not going to I'm not gonna break up with him. You're better off doing that because the moment you break up with the person, it just creates another narrative. Then it becomes a divorce narrative. Like people still go on and on about flipping... You know, Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston to this day. Do you know what I mean? So sometimes just staying and looking like the fool in the public just might be, it might be just less drama. But yeah, what a mad situation, man. Mad, mad situation. Um, just sad to see these chatty patties have infested the male population in it. But what can you do? What can you do? Um, is that it? Or should we do something else? What else I want to talk about on the list? 
J I think that's it, man. Three three nine. Let's keep it there. That's episode number three three nine, the X Zinger Show. Thanks so much for tuning in. If it's your first time listening or watching, make sure you make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and obviously make sure you uh, leave me a comment if you have any questions. If you're watching or listening via the podcast app, of course, leave me a five star review and share the show with your friends. Um, and again, I'll probably see you guys next week. I'm gonna do a little bit of a like, maybe I'm gonna do a live DJ stream. I think hopefully in Pirate soon. I wanna record a little set and send it off to like horror that berlin online radio station so i can essentially do a, a little live guest spot there soon i really fancy and want to do that very very soon i love that channel i love that youtube show i think it's brilliant definitely check it out if you haven't already it's h-o-r berlin white and green logo they sort of record in essentially like a is it a toilet or a shower room with a webcam um fish islands it's all kind of white and green black and green color schemes streamed live on youtube and facebook it's brilliant definitely check that out so i might record the stream or mix um upload it onto this channel of course and then of course send it over to those guys and see if i am allowed to do a set there once i visit berlin soon and maybe when i visit berlin the clubs have reopened that'll be sick as well isn't it? imagine that bloody hell but yeah until then thanks so much for tuning in guys i'll see you guys very very soon take care be safe bye